Welcome back, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Swadik Mayanja, but you can call me Q. And yes, I am Q the Nurse. And on this channel, I bring you news, current events, and fun topics for nurses everywhere. Um, today, we have another co-host. You know, I'm telling you guys, I love doing the nursing news when there's a co-host. When I'm doing it by myself, I feel lonely. I rant. <laughs> I talk too long. It's a good thing when I have guests on and I have Adrian back on the show. Good things. Good things Hello. Adrian. <laughs> yes, Adrian, welcome, 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 and thank you. For thank you. Thank you. It's course. good to be back. So we've got a few stories, and, you know, Adrian is the kind of host that she doesn't come empty-handed. She she herself suggested a story, so I am very excited. I love it. You know, you get the crew going, you get the juices flowing. It's a good thing, Adrian. It's a good thing. Indeed. Um, but before we get into our stories, I got to talk to you about my two affiliate programs that I am a part of, number one, uh, TYT. So all you guys need to uh, understand, listen. I started doing this nursing news thing after I watched the uh, TYT. If you don't know what TYT is, it's the Young Turks. I like to consider them. They like to consider themselves the progressive Netflix. If you want any kind of news that is progressive version, on the left side of things, TYT is the place to go. If you don't know what's going on, it's primary season. I don't know what you're doing, all right? You must be living under a rock. Go to the Young Turks. Use the link in the description box below. Go check them out. Go sign up. But if you use the link below, you're going to be helping me while I help you. We're we'll in this together. Let's do it. That's number one. Number two, um, NRSNG. Listen, listen, you know, it, right now it's February. It's the end of the semester for a lot of you nursing students are coming around the corner, right? You guys got uh, midterms, you guys got final exams, and most importantly, for those who are graduating this year, you guys have the NCLEX. If you want to be ready for the NCLEX, if you think that you have it in you to pass this NCLEX or your final exam or whatever it is you need to do, NRSNG has you hooked up. They got everything for you, all right? They got flashcards, they got seminars, they got... They got everything you need to make sure you pass your NCLEX, your final exam, your nursing school, whatever you need. They got it. All right. Business right out the way. Business right there. out the way. Nursing.com. I've, you- been us- I've been using nursing.com back when it was NRSNG. Love them. Love oh, wait, them. seriously? Are you being I'm serious? I'm serious. I'm serious. I I've, could- I've been I they've John Hawes, I think yes. is the guy. Yeah. Yes. He's I I mean he's he's been an authority in my life since before I was in nursing school. Like I've consumed so much of their content. It's amazing. I paid, I can't remember how much the app is, but the app, it does have kind of a price tag with it, but my God, it's, it's amazing. I use it all the time. Seriously. You guys listen. And I'm not, and I'm not part of the affiliate program. So this is like honest review, like unpaid (laughs) non-spawn review. I, I had no idea. This is not yeah. something we try to sneak up on you, right? I, no. I just had Adrian on. She didn't know. I didn't know Adrian was a. And what what cues got for you? If you use the link down below, it's a dollar for the first month. It is pricey. I know you nursing students, and I know you nursing. So got the money. so worth it though. Oh my Do God. it. We'll, we'll, Jump on it. We can talk about that another time. We can yes. go on a long spree of nursing apps, but mm. that's like my number one. That's my that's my go to. All right, so we've got a couple of stories to, um, this week for you. Um, and this week, we are going back to having the nurse of the week. And I love having the nurse of the week. It's kind of the reason I started all this good stuff. So we've got all the stories for you. We've got nurses that shaving their heads. We've got nurses that have been being really bad nurses, hurting people. We've got all the stories. And we have 25 things to look forward to if you are a nurse in 2020. Uh, we got mm-hmm. things, all right? So let's just jump on in. Story number one, hospital failed to protect patients who attacked and violently abused one of their patients, okay? So um, this is in actually Portland, Maine. And if you don't know, I'm doing travel nurse um, uh, assignment here in Maine. So this was close to home for me. So let me just tell you what it is about and then we'll chat. A federal agency has found that Portland Hospital failed to protect patients from physical abuse on two occasions last summer in which a security guard and a nurse each allegedly struck patients who were acting violently. Okay. In one of the cases on July 10th, this is last year, remember 2019, a security guard at Maine Medical Center struck a mentally impaired patient multiple times after the patient who had been admitted to the acute psychiatric unit um, struck the officer in the face while being restrained. So understand, the patient was being restrained. They were in a psych unit. Everyone knew the patient was violent and the security guard still harmed the patient. And in the second case, and the first one was the security guard, second case was the actual nurse. 
In another case on July 22nd, uh, 26th of 2019, a registered nurse was attempting to give oral medication to an 83-year-old patient with dementia who was receiving treatment for, a broken, for broken ribs, collapsed lung, and suffered um, during a fall. After the patient spit out the medication that the nurse gave her um, and punched the nurse in the chin, the nurse yelled out, you fucker, and punched the patient right in the rib where the patient had an injury, where the patient had a broken rib. The nurse punched the patient in the rib, according to a report from another um, staff member that saw this whole thing play out. Adrian, 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 Adrian. I have, some, I have some type of feelings about this. This is a very difficult story for me. Um, first, first thoughts about after hearing uh, what the security guard and the uh, nurse did before I tell everybody what happened and what the hospital did to those two employees. For me, it's cut and dry. Unacceptable. Absolutely never happen event. Um, I have been punched by patients with mental impairment, whether it be delirium, dementia, um, my reaction, like I've been punched in the face, I've been punched in the ribs. Um, when you come into nursing, especially in acute care, especially in a psych unit, yes, there is high likelihood that someone is, like I've had old ladies try to dig their fingernails into me. My reaction is never, I have never thought about retaliating with any type whether it be physical verbal um i'm sorry absolutely unacceptable yeah no i mean i'm i'm pretty black and white on this like at no point is it okay for you to lay hands on a patient yes. call them names especially 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 with patients that have some mental or cognitive impairment that is no fault of their own yep. um I feel a little differently if like you're drunk and you're an asshole and yeah. you're like trying to like, if you're threatening my life, I'm going to react of like course. human beings do that. That's yes. like, but if you're laying in a bed and you spit out your medicine, which happens, people get confused. Dementia is a fucking nightmare for people. Really so is. you just, no, there's no room for this. I'm sorry. This requires um, that those people be taken away from the bedside. Um, yes. and I don't, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I don't have, I have zero tolerance for this. Shit. So, so, uh, so this is actually a little, it's a little funny because I, I, um, all right, let me just say this. Look, listen, for the first, <laughs> for the first incident where the security guard, um, um, hit the patient that was being violent while the patient was getting restrained mm -hmm. and the patient was going up to a psych unit. I'm with you. I'm a thousand percent with you. You, you're, number one, you're a security guard. Number two, it's a psych unit. And number three, most importantly, the patient is in the process of being restrained. Like so, you're handling it. Yeah, like exactly. something's happening. Like right? chill out. There's no reason in that situation. Everyone has been in that situation, right? A, a couple of weeks ago, we were in like, we had to call a security guard up. There was a patient mm -hmm. that needed Zyprexa that was flailing and punching and f biting and throwing things at. No one this thought even for one second, I want to hurt this patient. Mm -hmm. Everyone understood that this patient was, in the, uh, was just in a bad place. They were being violent, yes, to the um, staff, but no one thought that we need to retaliate with fighting, with punching, mm -hmm. with any physical harm. The second situation, Adrian, listen, I don't know what it is, but I think, look, in the second situation, it was the nurse giving the patient some meds. The patient spit out the meds, and the thing that gets me the, the worst is that the, pa the patient punched the nurse in the chin. So... I feel like there are just like immediate reactions human beings have when people invade their privacy. And this is, this patient wasn't on a psych unit. This patient wasn't in the process of getting restrained. This patient was just a confused uh, patient with dementia, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to say I give the nurse the benefit of the doubt, but at the same time, I want to give the nurse the benefit of the doubt just because Adrian, when someone like spits in your face or pushes you or bites you. Does it you, say spits in her face? No, no, no. I'm just. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But I'm just saying. It doesn't say that. No, it does not say that. And this was uh, corroborated by another hospital, uh, another staff member at the hospital. What it legitimately says is that the patient spit out the meds and punched the nurse in the chin. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. And look, the thing. How old was this patient? 
Uh, I don't know the details, but okay. I, I, oh, okay. 83, 83. The patient okay. is 83 years old. Okay. Yeah. 83, demented, in a hospital bed. I, I get it. There's like, there's certain reactions that are just that. They're reactions. They're yes. reflexes. However, like I said, um, I think that we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard than that. If you have a demented patient, you need to be aware of the fact that they're going to behave erratically, that they're maybe going to feel threatened at times, um, that you are in a position to move. Like I assume this patient was in a bed or a chair and was not like coming at her in a way that she needed to defend herself. And so while I do see your side, I'm not inhuman, <laughs> there are gray spaces everywhere. I still think that as a nurse, you need to be anticipating those moments where you could be in harm's way and you got to be light on your fucking feet. Exactly. If I have a dementia patient, I'm going to be cautious about where their hands are, what they're like, you know, you have that patient that you're like talking to them it, and it's happened to me before with dementia and delirium patients, which those are different. Delirium is, can happen to anyone at any time. It often happens in hospitals because we're waking them up and they're on meds and like, they're kind of out of their heads. They're not, exactly. they're confused. But with a dementia patient, like, you know, I've talked to those patients before where you're like talking to them and they're fine. And then all of a sudden their face changes. <laughs> oh, you see that face. <laughs> and you see that face. As a nurse, you need to learn to read this shit because you need to know, oh, this guy is about to like do something. He's going to try to bite me or hit me. So I think that as nurses, we, especially if you're working with dementia patients, this is something that we need to be aware of at all times. Like you are never, you should never assume your safety with a stranger who is hospitalized, which means they have all sorts of shit going on. Like, you know, it's like when I was on locked psych unit, they were basically like, don't let the patient be between you and the door. Yeah. Like you constantly have to be aware of these things. Furthermore, it wasn't like she got punched and she like punched back, slapped him in the face, hit him in the arm. She specifically hit him in the area of injury yes. while saying, fucker. Yes. So we don't know. Now, the other thing is the, when we read news stories, we don't know. Did he hit her like this or did he hit her like this? Right. Because we know some 80 year old patients, even as frail <laughs> as they look, they have yeah. superhuman strength. <laughs> oh, amen to that. From. <laughs> I get it. But also, like, if you have an 83 year old dementia patient, expect the fact that they might, like, do something that's not normal. Exactly. Um, so I have, I have, I have limited desire to give leeway on this because I think of myself in this situation at the bedside, you know, 2,300 hours, I'm trying to give this patient their liquid Tylenol and I get punched in the face. Yeah. Like it's happened to me before. Like I was punched in the head by a patient that was extremely tall and I'm five, two. And Are you really uh, five, two? I'm I'm like five two. And... <laughs> okay. But well, dance goes <laughs> give me another like inch and a quarter. So. Look, so so look so so see so I I went to bat for the nurse, but what you said tipped me over the edge, right? You because you're right. Number like number one, look, I I understand the immediate reaction. If the mm -hmm. if the story was the nurse pushed the patient back or slapped the hand away, I'd mm -hmm. be like yeah. No, that yeah. makes sense. That's that's an initial reaction. But to like is, aim for the rib. Takes, yeah, these if you aiming for the patient's rib when you know the patient had a broken rib and that's the reason they're in the goddamn hospital, mm -hmm. I can't be on your side. And you called the patient a fucker. I can't be on your side. It seems like it was there was a lot more intention to that reaction than uh like than just like an yeah. immediate reaction that anyone would have. I think but when we're at the bedside, we need to have higher standards than you would normally have. If I was on the street waiting at a bus stop and somebody punched me in the chin, my reaction is probably going to be to try to lay that fucker out. Honestly. Right? Get it, Amy. But, Get your but, that's, <laughs> but, but then I'm not wearing my professional hat. I am not there for, like, you are, you're supposed to protect these people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. they're confused. They're so let me tell scared. you guys. Let me tell you guys what happened to these uh, two employees. The workers who were uh, the subject of the complaints um, last summer no longer work for the hospital. The nurse who allegedly punched the patient in the ribs was arrested and charged with a class C felony. I don't know what that means, um, but a class C felony of endangering the welfare of a dependent person. According to the report, the security guard was reportedly charged with assault. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I think, I mean, I, I don't want to say they did the right thing, but I think they did the right thing just because like what we said at the end, it seems too like premeditated to punch a patient who came in for broken ribs. And in you the know, rib. I think that, 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 that tipped me off. That just tipped me off. That was like, no, that's, it's not something you just do. Like no one aims for the ribs when, you know, it's, it's just, it's we just need not. to, we need to hold ourselves to an extremely high standard. Exactly. I've also heard this, you know, not to get too far off, by the way, I just Googled class C felony. It's the least serious felony, mm. but it still may be punished by no less than a year in jail up to 10 years. Um, and Ooh. if you have a previous felony conviction, it can be no less than two years and fines up to 15 grand. A year in jail so, is a long time. Adrian. Yeah. Yes, it is. Especially when for anyone and not yeah. even especially. When, exactly. But, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how I feel. I'm not, you know, I'm not well-versed in criminal justice. I think it's a slippery slope when we start jailing people for situations like this. However, I do think that it's important that that hospital, it said something about how like they are like retraining people exactly. in de-escalation techniques. You really need to look at also what is happening to your staff? What makes a staff person feel that way that they're so reactionary? Is this like the sixth person to hit that nurse today? Is this, you know, is this nurse on an 18 hour shift because she was mandated? Like, I get it. I'm I, Initially I'm like, fuck no, never. I really do. I have those like never event uh, mindset with this, but also to be completely fair, I don't know this nurse. I don't know the history. I don't know what the surrounding circumstances were. I can't say that I'd be cool with it if that was like the sixth person that had hit me that night. Right. Like then I might just be like, fuck her. Like, you know, you just <laughs> pop, uh, the top pops yeah. off and you're like, eh. and I don't think that's excusable really either. But to be fair to this nurse, I don't know that I necessarily think this nurse should be imprisoned. Exactly. For Look, um, I love, so yeah. that's the thing. Um, we'll wrap this up, but um, the story up. But Yeah, like, sorry. I, I love, can no, keep no, 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 no. I, and I appreciate it because the Adrian, you're right. You got to look at it holistically. Yes, we got to talk about the ex the specific incident, but that's two employees at the same hospital. This, yeah. I mean, maybe it's a culture thing. Maybe you're right there. Oh, all of these employees are working 17 hour shifts every day for six days a week. We don't yeah. know what it is, but we don't know. Um, it's a good thing to look at it holistically. And I am on your side on the, obviously we're nurses. We're not well versed in criminal justice, but a year, that's a long time. It's just a long time. Yeah. Moving forward. All right, ladies. So this one touches close to home, all right? Because you know both Adrian and I, we put a whole lot of content out there. But this, this I, let, let me tell you the details, and then we'll talk about how we feel about it, all right? Mm -hmm. So nurses and doctors are flocking to TikTok. If you ain't got a TikTok, where are you? It's 2020, all right? <laughs> nurses and doctors are flocking to tw TikTok to crack jokes and lip sync. But are they eroding patients' trust? That is the question. Um, so let me tell you a, a very specific incident for two healthcare-themed TikToks that have gone viral as of late, um, as of late have been widely derided. A now deleted clip from a user named Nurse Holly, and for in the post-production, I'll show you a video of what Nurse Holly did, um, was widely criticized this month for stating that abstinence is the best form of SDI prevention. And then before that, a nurse who goes by D Rose on TikTok, who mocked patients for faking their symptoms, accidentally kicked off a hashtag movement that led um, to thousands of users, patients, um, to share their moments when the medical providers didn't believe them. Um, and I just want to give you a little insight of what some people in the medical field feel about this kind of story and feel about, feel about nurses and healthcare professionals putting this kind of stuff out there on the internet. Dr. Matthew Burke, who is a neurologist at the University of Toronto um, and has written about the dis um, dissolution of patient-physician trust, said flippant clips about healthcare made and shared by healthcare professionals are emblematic of a broader issue within medicine. Um, Adrian, I love that I have you on here and I don't just have another nurse uh, just like a random nurse, just, I wanted, like, it's a good thing that I have someone on that does put stuff out there on the internet, all content physics about nursing, about patients, about healthcare. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about this? Cause I feel like it could be a slippery slope, but at the same time, it is as, at the mm -hmm. same time, it's HIPAA. It's patient. I mean, like mm -hmm. you're a nurse, that's your job. This is what you're supposed to do. 
-hmm. How do you feel? How do you feel about this? So first of all, this is why I don't do live content. This is why I don't do like live streams because I want to make sure that my episodes and my content is so squeaky clean of anything that could be a HIPAA violation. Mm. And the, and things you might not even think of as HIPAA violations are. And I have the benefit of the fact that I've worked in healthcare for a very long time. So a lot of the stories that I'm telling are things that happened anywhere from two to 14 years ago. And so you have to be impeccable with it. So that's the first thing I'll say is that with HIPAA, you can't fuck around Mm -hmm. because um, uh, it can have real consequences for people. Like even, um, you know, recently I, you know, have thought about how on my unit we have patients that, you know, we see people with long-term lung illnesses and we also do end-of-life care. So we unfortunately, Unfortunately, get the, the the truly the honor of taking care of people that we've known for years as they're like dying, and so then after these people pass away, we have all these nurses like sharing obituaries online and saying like, "Oh, I loved this person." Well, you're a nurse, and you're posting an obituary of someone who recently died, and the obituary says they died at your hospital. Like that becomes very messy. So there are all these instances where people are just like, oh, I'll just share this because I cared about this person. So we have to be really immaculate with this. So when I edit my episodes, I'm making sure that if there's anything that could potentially link to a patient, um, even if it's something really benign, like, oh, they're from, I don't know, they're from New South Wales. Yeah. Well, that's not common in Iowa. So if even saying something like that can be a huge a huge violation. violation yeah um and if somebody complains they're gonna drag you into that office like i once it it ended up okay and i learned a huge lesson from it but once i posted something on facebook where i like almost violated hipaa and one of the nurses that i worked with which i don't have hard feelings for her she did the right thing turned me in for posting something that she thought was a hipaa violation and fortunately i had the foresight to go through and you know, erase all of these things because people had said like, you probably shouldn't have done that. But that next day I was called into HR and they made me pull up my Facebook profile. They said, we want to see. And so you have to remember that at any point you have to be proud of the content you're putting out and be willing to sit down in HR and say, yeah, here's my website. The other thing I want to say just briefly about this, because I could get long winded about this also, is that um, when it comes to like, you know, the nurse that was on TikTok that was like uh, uh, trying to joke on the fact that like patients, like we can tell when you're faking or whatever. First of all, when I make jokes or like we laugh about things like pet peeves, my top pet peeves about nursing, most of my top pet peeves, they're not directed at patients. It's like situational. You know, it's like when you're cleaning up poop and then you put clean linens down and then they immediately poop again. I don't care who you are. That's kind of fucked up and kind of funny. But I'm not like making fun of like people who have certain illnesses or like I, you know, there are so many autoimmune disorders and so many patients that don't get treated properly because nobody believes them or people dismiss their symptoms. It's a huge problem in healthcare. And so for us to joke around about that, I think is just a little bit too touchy. And with nurse Holly, who I, you know, who I was following, like I was watching her shit and some of her stuff did kind of piss me off. Some of it's kind of funny, but we need to be really careful. Like, are we making fun of situations? Are we making fun of things that need to be improved? Are we doing this with a spirit of advocacy? Cause like, even though I laugh about what, um, you know, stupid shit that I have to do for nursing, like messes I clean up or like weird things that you would never think of nurses having to deal with. Um, But at the end of the show or the end of whatever I'm doing, I remember to say, even though I laugh about all this stuff, I would never trade my job for a million years. And you have to have a sense of humor about it. But when you start hitting people where it hurts, like people that Especially, I think it's um, um, black women are the most likely to be not believed about their mm-hmm. symptoms. And we also know that women suffer from things like, for, at one point, fibromyalgia. I mean, still to this day, people are like, fibromyalgia? Uh-huh. I'm sure. Sure. Mm-hmm. But people don't realize that, like, chronic pain, we don't know everything about the body. Yeah. And so to make jokes about this borders on inappropriate for me. Most of Last third, Go third ahead. Last Hit thing. me is that I'm just laying it all out for you. Filming in the hospital or in your facility where you work, this is also a very dangerous Mm. and slippery slope. 
I do this, but I also feel confident that if my supervisor or my nurse manager and I were to sit down and go through all of my content, you do not see a face of a person in the hospital. You do not see a license plate. You do not see signage about what clinics I'm in. You do not see me like I'm doing this shit. Like, first of all, your patients always come first. I don't care if you're on the internet, like I work night shift. If yes. the unit is clean, your patients are cared for, everything that you could possibly do to have tasks done that are on your responsibility. Sometimes you have downtime. Sometimes your time management is really good. If I go into the break room and I wanna record a clip for 30 seconds, I'm confident that I can, if my nurse manager were to say, hey, I just saw that you were recording in that empty patient room, like, what's what's the deal i'd be like well my patients are asleep my meds are given the unit is clean my pod mates are all good nobody needs any help snuck in here and now i'm back to work so your hospital you need to know your hospital's policy my hospital has a policy that says like post at your own risk there's not really tight guidelines mm. but also on the other hand i follow guidelines where i don't make friends with patients on facebook if they want to follow my public profiles like on insta that's cool and they do and they send me messages like i'll make a joke about something and they'll be like hey i remember something like that happened to me once and it was really funny so i know that i'm connecting with people on at an appropriate level, but you constantly have to be evaluating your content. And that is all I'll say. Sorry, that's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. And I think this is, no, I think this is good because I did want to show um, the folks and you the actual video mm -hmm. specifically. And I agree with a lot of what you're saying. And, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how I feel specifically after we just watch these couple of videos, sure, sure. because I think it's, I think it's, I think I just, I think it's important that we do this. Okay. So there it you is. You can see the screen. I can see Holly. Yeah. All right. Word. So this is the video of nurse Holly. And I just said, as she said, abstinence only is the way to go. <laughs> Just the truth. So that's it. I mean, I mean, if you guys don't have TikTok, I don't know what you're doing, but TikTok is very like it's it's very, very, very short clips. And for those who are listening mm -hmm. to the podcast version of this, it's um it's it's literally Holly in uh, nurse Holly, she's in her scrub, she has a stethoscope on, and there's like word bubbles up and it literally says the best way to prevent um STDs is waiting till marriage. That's I mean, that is it, okay? So I have a couple of feelings about this. Look. Um, it's, I think TikTok is very much, if you guys remember what Vine was, TikTok is very mm -hmm. much like Vine. Like the goal of TikTok is comedy. The goal of TikTok is like really quick clips, funny, like lip syncing, dancing videos, like just like all of these really quick memes. It's like heavy, heavy on memes. Um, and you want to be funny. And if you were to sit, if a patient were to sit at a nurse's station and listen to the kind of shit we say, <laughs> oh my God, right? We would, all of us would be screwed. All of us would be screwed. But that's, <laughs> but that's in the culture of working in a hospital. That's when you're at the nurse's station. That's when you're around other nurses that are in the units of like, you know, it's, it's very, very different. When you decide to take something out of the hospital, when you decide mm -hmm. to do this on your own time, when you're not a nurse, when you decide to make it public and not just public, like putting a poster down at town hall, but make it public where it's on the internet, where everyone and their mother can see for the rest of mm -hmm. time, that changes everything, right? That yeah. does change everything. And this, like, I have to be honest. I got to be honest. This really made me look twice at the stuff I put out there. Adrian, I feel like you had like a really good policy about what you decide to post, what you choose not to post, how you don't like to go live and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's, that's probably the best practice, especially when you're in healthcare. Cause look, ladies and gentlemen, it is okay. I'm not going to, I'm not going to downplay any of this. TikTok is a great place. If you're a healthcare professional and you want to make jokes about what you do at work, you've got to, you've got it. It's just, a, it's a part of yeah. life, but I mean, being a nurse is very different than being an engineer. When you're an engineer, you're dealing with machines, mechanics, you're dealing with things that like just things. When you're a nurse, when you're in healthcare, you're dealing with other human beings and your right to share what you do at work stops where it involves the other person, any mm -hmm. other person. So 
Adrian, I really, I really, really, really appreciate what you said about how you go about dealing with po posting stuff and putting anything out there. Look, I don't think that either of those nurses should get like horribly punished, lose their jobs or anything like that, but they really do need to sit down in a conversation and just like, just rethink what they put out there because it, that just seeing what happened to them mm -hmm. made me rethink what I should be putting out there, the things I should be saying and what I should be sharing. And you do have to think about how, how would you feel if, you know, you're a patient and then your nurse walks in and you're like, Oh shit, it's that nurse from TikTok. Right. And you already know that they think that everybody's full of shit about their pain. Here's the thing. The other thing I'll say about that is the joke or the TikTok about like, Oh, I'm allergic to Tylenol and all this other like, you know, non-NARC uh, medications, yep. but, but Dilaudid works. Here's the thing. There, there are a couple things I want to say about this. Yeah, we do see drug seekers, but to assume that everyone that needs high dose pain medicine is a drug seeker is not, not always the right way to approach it. Because, um, you know, if I come in and I've had a chronic condition for 20 years and I know that taking Tylenol doesn't do shit for my pain and I want to bypass the hours of waiting for the Tylenol to, to be proven ineffective and I know what I want. But then people say things like, um, you know, if you say, well, I know Tylenol doesn't work. Can we go to the second? Because according to like governing bodies and regulatory bodies with pain medication, doctors have to, at least in my hospital, I don't know how it is elsewhere. I assume this is like a widespread thing, mm -hmm. but we have to label medication as first line, second line, third line, which basically says that you have to try so say Tylenol is usually first and then like, you know, uh, half a oxycodone or Lortab or something is second. And then third, we go to Dilaudid, which is the big gun. Well, you have to usually, even if I know my patient is in so much pain that Tylenol is not going to do shit, I have to justify why I didn't do the first line, second line medications. Yeah. So as nurses, we need to really evaluate this carefully because there is an opioid epidemic. People are addicted to drugs. These are highly addictive. And also when you have to back off these pain medications, it becomes really difficult to get out of the hospital because you need so much pain meds. We can't le let you leave just walking around with like buckets of Dilaudid that you need to control your pain. It's a multifaceted issue, but like when we're talking about joking about people being in pain, um, it, it's a hot button topic. You know, really like you have to, you have to know your audience. And if you have a patient that knows that Tylenol is going to just leave them sitting here in the same amount of pain. The other thing is, is that people don't understand what an allergy is. <laughs> right. <laughs> and this is really down to medical um, literacy, yes. healthcare literacy. Like when someone says to you, I'm allergic to Tylenol. Well, maybe they're just bullshitting you and they're trying to tell you that they're allergic to Tylenol, but they'll take their Lortab, which has Tylenol in it. And they don't know. Sometimes it's because they're trying to get you to give them a higher dose or something like that. But oftentimes people just don't know what an allergy is. And, That's and, true. and just to, just to, just to back up, like, to reiterate what you just said, it's super important because yeah, if you're a nurse, if you're a healthcare provider, you have heard that joke, specifically that joke mm -hmm. about, oh, only Dilaudid works. And we all know why people say that. And yes, it is. You do have those patients that come through, uh, uh, like frequently and they ask for specifically Dilaudid and you do see they are seekers, right? Mm -hmm. But when you do carry that and say that's the majority of patients, that's a problem. But on top of that, on top of that, we have to understand as healthcare providers that a lot of these um, opioid um, epidemic patients, victims, uh, bodies Mm -hmm. are because they start out by getting some of these narcotics at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it is a very hard it's thing to balance. You have to be careful. You, yeah. you really do have to be careful. But joking about it, it's, it's a touchy Poor subject. Poor form. Poor yeah. form. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a touchy subject and it's hard, right? And so, really, I think, you know, you have to come down to it. How, how would you feel if every patient you take care of from now until the end of your career knows that you said this stuff on the internet and that's exactly. how you feel? Um, that's why I really try to stay away from talking about politics anywhere online, especially in my public nursing uncensored life. Yes. Because not because I don't have strong convictions or not because I don't want to use my influence for 
whatever good it can be, but more so because I don't want a, one of my patients to ever think that I'm going to treat them differently because I know something about what we believe is different. Yeah. I don't want that to ever be a factor. So uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to touch upon that towards uh, at the end of nursing news for so for those who are listening, please stick around because I do want to have a thorough conversation about that and legitimately that topic about how much it is okay to share and how does that mm -hmm. affect your patient care. I do want to talk to you about that at the end, Adrian. Okay. Cool. So moving on, we did talk, we, we just talked about a couple of bad healthcare employees, a couple of bad nurses. I don't want to say bad, but nurses that had made Questionable mistakes, judgment. Right. Um, so now it's time to take turn that corner and talk about some nurses that just make you say, Oh my God, God damn it. I'm proud to be a nurse. Okay. Um, so, we're talking about a few Chinese nurses um, that heading in Wuhan. I hope I'm saying mm -hmm. that right. They are shaving their heads to treat the coronavirus patients because long hair can spread the disease. This is incredible. Incredible. All right. Mm -hmm. So as of Tuesday morning, the no novel coronavirus, formerly known as 2019 NCOV, whatever the hell, it's a coronavirus, all right? Mm -hmm. It killed more than 1,000 people and has infected nearly 43,000 people across the world. Everywhere, every country, every city, every town is talking about, oh my goodness, our first coronavirus patient. Oh my goodness, our 15th coronavirus patient. But it all started um, in Wuhan, China. And these nurses in Wuhan, China have decided, some of them have decided we're going to shave our heads because it's just quicker, more efficient. But before I show you the video of some of these nurses who are shaving their heads to help them to take care of their patients, let me tell you what they, why the reasoning behind it, right? So having no hair achieves a few things. Number one, it prevents the infection from spreading via exposed hair. And number two, it also makes it easier to put on and take off protective gear. If you are a nurse, you understand how long it takes you when you're standing out of a precaution room, when you got to put the gown on and the hat on and the mask on. So it helps. It definitely helps. And to continue on how much and how far these nurses are going to take care of these patients, some hospital staff in Wuhan are going to extreme lengths to save time and get um, to more patients, including, including wearing adult diapers instead of taking bathroom breaks. This is insane, Adrian. This is insane. It's like stuff out of like a pandemic movie. This is like... Right? So one of the things I just, I just Googled this while I was... Um, sitting here listening to you read this article. So the um, number of nurses in China, so let's just do basic numbers, okay? Because yeah. this is a big deal. And this is part of the reason why this, this very contagious illness is spreading so quickly. And I'm not, again, not a public health expert. I'm not an expert on the systems in China. I just know what I've researched and what I've talked to from people who have seen some things. Anyway, so there are um, 4.1 million nurses, according to um, this like random statistics Wait, reporting. Is this the world? This is the world, or is this? No, this is in China. China. Okay, good. I was yeah. going to be like, there's definitely more in the world. Yeah, no, 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 no. In in China, yeah. according to this statistical, this is from November of 19. This is mm -hmm. the last time there was data. 4.1 million nurses. Okay, the number of people in China whole everyone is 1.386 billion B billions, billions. <laughs> that's yes. a big number <laughs> so so that's like 300 people per nurse jesus fucking christ and the number of doctors i believe is even of well course. i don't know let's see no it has it's to gotta be, be yeah it yeah it has to be less I so mean, reason to get paid. imagine that in a pandemic in, in the part of the world you're in, or this very highly, I don't know if it's actually a pandemic, but this very contagious illness. The World and Health suddenly, Organization has said that this is- Yes, a, okay. Like, so, yeah. and now you are responsible for going to your job that you've had for years, but now all of a sudden there's like hundreds of people lining the fucking hallways and streets with this thing that they could sneeze on you and get you sick. Exactly. You got to wear PPE, personal protective equipment. They're wearing like full on, like, um, what are the, what are the suits called? Uh, like Hazmat suit. suits. Yeah. Um, yeah. Think about how it feels. I think about how it feels just to wear an ISO gown while I'm cleaning up poop for exactly. like 15 minutes. Yeah. Now you're wrapped in plastic for the entirety of your day. Got 
mask strapped to your face. Like I, I was and you And you have to, to listen, and you have to change. It's not like, yo, you yeah, just yeah, laugh no, in no, plastic no. and yeah, you yeah, go yeah. into all the rooms. Uh-huh. You change every single different room. Every, so yeah, every single it's time. It's a different So suit. while I was wearing my mask, while I had this like upper respiratory shit going on last week, the tops of my ears got so sore and red. Like I started to get like an open sore just from wearing it while I was at work for 12 hours. Yeah. Um, now imagine wearing this shit all day while you're working. And so I listen to this and I go, God, adult diapers. Hell no. I'd get like dermatitis and like my ass would hurt. And how do you (laughs) also when you think about the fact that these are not normal circumstances, this is not your normal day at work. This is like scary shit. So so these nurses are amazing for, but also I'm like, if I was hot and I had like long hair, I'd shave that shit off too. Oh, you you got it you got it a leg up on it you already got it like i'm lucky i'm lucky in that in that, in that <laughs> sense but look you guys for those who are watching i do want to show you the video um it, it, it i think it's just i i love it i just i think i just i you have to see it because it just for me it touches at a different place okay so just mm-hmm. just hang out it's a 20 second 26 second video just hang out and watch this, these ladies get the hair cut off wait adrian you can see this and hear it yeah right? i can see it yeah. okay good. So it's like a super short video and it's just it, like, and it's not. So when I say people are shaving their heads, I just wanted to put it out there and show that video because yes, some nurses uh, for the, for the thumbnail for this video, you are going to see a bunch of nurses with their head totally shaven off just mm-hmm. like mine. But there are some nurses that are just, just doing the practical version of it and shaving just the back of their necks all the way the up. The stuff that top. would stick out. Exactly. The stuff mm-hmm. that would stick out. From um, like a, a, a hair, a head covering or exactly. like a mask. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's not everyone's cutting all of their hair off, but this is such a big deal. And as Some of them are though. Yeah, it is a huge deal. And like they're they're full they're fully fully shaved in this photo in the article. Oh yeah yeah yeah, and that's what I'm saying. A, a, a minority of the people who are getting their head shaved are are shaving it all off, but a lot of people who have decided to shave their hair uh, are just doing the edges to make sure that nothing mm-hmm. is sticking out of the yeah. uh, protective uh, gear that they have to wear. And listen. If you guys didn't know this, I don't know who, what you're doing, but nursing is a majority female profession. And when I say majority, I don't mean majority like 53%. I mean majority like 80, 90% female pro- pro- profession. So when you hear things like people are getting their hair shaved off to take care of patients, I can't... Like, the amount- huge self-sacrifice. Huge exactly. self-sacrifice. It's humongous. These nurses are giving up a part of who they are, what they look like, they, how they represent themselves in public to take care of these patients. And I know it's hard times calling for hard things to happen, but this is a big deal. I don't know what I would do that would change my life outside of nursing to take care of patients. That is such And a here's the question. thing. We also, this doesn't mean their salaries are increasing. No, like they're not, not getting any extra perks out of this. Nothing. This is basic. Like this is because it also says in the article that like even shaving off a few minutes a day, shaving off on. <laughs> there you go, girl. But, um, but even like saving a few minutes a day and getting their PPE on and off dealing with like, yeah, I keep my hair pretty short, but mm. if I had to be like taking this stuff on and off and tucking my hair, I mean, that's like. That is, it's time consuming when you're dealing with these kind of extreme circumstances. So um, these these women are, but you know, it's like, how much would you have to get paid to wear an adult diaper at work? Exactly. Like See, how- that's, that's the one that got me. I was like, what? Adult diaper? Like how much time are you actually- Like really saving? imagine yourself, like not just an abstract concept of like, oh, nurses wearing diapers. Like actually imagine you're sitting right where you are right now charting, knowing that you need to change your- pea soaked diaper like That's what insane. the fuck is that it's craziness it is i don't know what they're doing i don't know how they and do if your bath smells breaks, like pee insane. like <laughs> you really feel like i know it's hard to get a bathroom break in but that's taken it to a new level a new oh. level is uh, an understatement all right moving on with these superstar nurses the nurse <laughs> of the week my favorite segment my favorite st- uh, story every week um uh we're talking about a nurse that sing- sings 
not just to one patient that blew up because it was a viral video, because I know that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. but this, is a, this is a nurse that makes singing part of her care, right? So we're meeting a, a, a singing nurse who helps heal patients with her voice, Kathleen Sarnas. I hope I'm saying that last name right. She is a hospice nurse that loves to sing to her patient. Um, she had this quote that just I just needed to share it with the rest of you nurses, um, healthcare providers out there. She said, nursing isn't just giving medications. You're catering to a person's mind body and spirit and then just to back up that sentiment because i know that sounds all holistically and hugs and kisses bs bullshit but it's a real thing all right mm -hmm. to back that up with some studies so studies suggest that music can help reduce pain and curb anxiety for patients receiving hospice care last year the national institute of health awarded 20 million dollars these are real dollars y'all i'm telling you it's a real thing 20 million dollars over five years to sound health initiative to explore the potential of music for treating a wide range of conditions resulting from the neurologic and other disorders. I love this story, Adrian. Mm -hmm. Singing, is that something you do? Have you ever sang to a patient? Do you ever sing with patients? Is music something you play in your patient's room? How do you deal? Is, is music something that ever comes up for you? Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> um, I think I covered all those questions. Yes. Um, so there... Um, again, my, on my unit, we do palliative care, which often is end of life. Sometimes it's just symptom management, mm -hmm. but music is a constant thing all the way down to the fact that our beds, like the hospital beds that we have at the footboard, there's like a touch screen. We can play music and nature sounds on our beds. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yo. We also, the beds also can speak a few different languages. They can say some pretty basic phrases. Are you serious, so Adrian? Way, I'm completely serious. What kind they're, of beds you guys got? Beds. They're striker beds. Um, there are some things about them that I don't like, like some little details that I'd like to change. But if I have an end of life patient and say their family isn't able to be there that night, you know, I'm a night nurse. If you don't want to just listen to the sound of an oxygen oxygen hissing or yes. you know, monitors down the hall beeping or the conversation at the nurse's station, you turn on a little freaking music. Yeah. And, you know, you also have to moderate, like, does this seem to agitate the patient? Does it seem to calm them? But we in our back room or in the, like the, the work room where our doctors and palliative nurse practitioners work during the day, there's like a whole box that's divided by category. We have music from all the decades, classical, country, rock, like I've even had patients that say to me like, hey, my dad listened to metal like 24 hours a day. Is it okay if I put some metal on my phone? And I'm like, as long as it's not Stay disturbing patients. other patients, rock right. the fuck out. Right. Um, but this does, you can see the difference this makes to people. And I've, I've, I've sang to people, um, I've sang with patients, um, I've whistled because I'll be like subconsciously whistling and then I'll be like, oh, sorry, I'll stop. And they'll be like, no, please, that's, you're a really good whistler. I'm a re <laughs> Fun fact about Adrienne, I'm a really good whistler. When I get going, like I can do, like I could, yeah. All right. So anyway, we also, you know, we have music therapy. We have boom boxes for all of our palliative rooms so that people, this is, this is very much a thing. And, um, you know, I like to think that as a, a teaching hospital, we try to be on the, the front, front edge of research and research says that this is a great adjunct to pain uh, medication. Yes. So yeah, people say like, oh, well, that medication doesn't really help might not help if you just take that medicine and keep watching Fox News, but maybe if we do your medicine, plus the music you like, plus a heat pack, plus right. a warm blanket, and we turn down the lights, these things can have cumulative of positive effects on patients. And then there's that, um, there's that documentary from a few years ago. I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll tell you later and you, can put it in the show notes or something, but yeah. there's uh, there are studies that have, they've taken music into uh, like nonverbal dementia patients and people who yes. haven't spoken in years, they start singing along with like some fucking Blue Moon or Louis Armstrong or <laughs> shit that they sang when they were a teenager. So, I mean, we've already seen, this is like, this is a thing where I'm like, why is the jury still out on this? Right? Like we already, we all have that song that can like bring us to tears, you know, or songs that like pump us up and rile us up. Like 
we can't, I, I don't know. I think as if anyone who denies the power of music on healing, but anyway, to get back to the point, this nurse sings to people and in the video clip, you're, are you going to play the video clip? That I don't have the video said? clip, but I can okay. put it in post. Anyway, in the video clip, she, she actually says to a patient, you know, she's like in their home. She's like checking his blood pressure. Yes. He's sitting in his armchair. He's got like a heat pack around his neck or whatever. And she's like, what kind of stuff did you use to sing? And he's like, I used to sing blue moon. And she just like kicks into blue moon. And then he starts singing with her. And that. meanwhile, the guy's daughter is like in the dining room, just like heart melting because she's like, I don't think my dad would still be here if he didn't have such good nursing care. Right. Um, I worked with a nurse a long time ago who used to, she had a beautiful voice and she'd be like doing people's baths and she'd just be like singing to them and like singing, you know, Jolene, Jolene, Jolene. <laughs> and it was just amazing. And it was so natural and happy for her and people loved it. I'd be like, oh yeah, Beth's going to be your nurse today. And they'd be like, oh, is she the singing nurse? Yeah, yeah, totally. She'll sing you some, you know, color me bad or something. It'll be great. <laughs> I love it. No, see, I, I you, you hit, you hit on everything I wanted to touch upon. You're right. You're right. And like <laughs> the thing, like the thing that is crazy is because like when you in, when you're in a hospital and you, you are a nurse, you are a healthcare pro a provider, like everything becomes, I don't want to say factory like, but you start doing the same things mm -hmm. to all the patients because you know what works. And I don't mean factory like because you just, you, you have master to... techniques. Exactly. And you use those techniques. And when something different, like, but at the same time, as a human being, you know that when you're outside of work, when you're doing your own thing, when you're just living, Music is a huge part of literally everybody's life. I don't know a, a single human being that says, I don't like music. You might not like country. You might not like rap. You might not like whatever. But, but no what kind of Philistine is like music? <laughs> <laughs> right? So Sunshine. It just, <laughs> it's just mind blowing that it's <laughs> taking us so this long to come to like the terms of, yeah, music fucking works. Yeah, Because every time I'm going down my assessments every day, you always that, that option for when you do go through pain is like, what worked? Like, did you do mm -hmm. non-pharmacological things? And a lot of the time I'll use distraction, but it's when the TV's on or when the family's there or all of that stuff. But music is a huge distraction and it's super, super healing. It's a beautiful thing. Kathleen Sarnas, um, if I'm saying that uh, last name right. You Hats are, off. Hats off is 100% right. I love it. I love it. I love it. Congratulations. You deserve that and so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I am going to skip the, the commercial story just because it has nothing to do with nursing, but it's just like the greatest commercial I've ever seen in the history of my life. Um, <laughs> but because I do want to talk about the story that you suggested. Uh, oh, yeah. And another thing. I've been saying your name is Adrian. Is it really Adrienne? It's Adrienne, but I oh, accept. Jesus Lord. But here's, Adrian, okay, so let, so, me, sorry, no, no, boo -boo. let me. So I've had friends before that I've been friends with for years that like, I actually have this friend that I knew for like a decade and he was always calling me Adrian. And then one of my other friends was like, hey, dumbass, her name's Adrienne. And he, he was like, why did you not correct me? I've known you for like most of my adult life. Sometimes I just glaze right over it. I don't even hear it. I don't know. Trust the me. things that get me is when people call me like Andrea, Ariana, which happens mm, all the time. I get weird. Andrian a lot. I'm like, is that even a name? I don't know. Um, but I accept all social, like all close for but it technically is adrian adrian but it doesn't look, really slow it doesn't really roll off the tongue like i wish it did it's totally fine look listen my name is swadek <laughs> listen the, the, way, the way people <laughs> fuck up my name i understand letting people say the wrong thing because it's just it's a lot of work You're just like, it's a lot it's, of work it, it, right i, I don't used to make a big that. deal out of it and then and my nickname is age A-G-E. I don't know Are where you that came from. That's always been my nickname. But then when I say that to people, they're like, Paige? No! <laughs> Paige without the P. And then it becomes a whole discussion. And then I feel like the most obnoxious person when I introduce myself. It's like, I can't do that. If I'm like at a conference or something, I'm like, I just, just, just call me Anne. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, right. when I go to restaurants, if I'm picking up carry out, I just tell him my name is Anne. And once a guy who knew me, like, but was the one to bring me my food. And he was like, you're not Anne. No, you're not. <laughs> look, but look, all right. So because sorry, I, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> I digress. We, we have time for one more story, but I didn't want to make this the story that you suggested. Cause I think this, it's a huge thing and it's a it big is, deal. Yeah. The, the story is super simple. 
25 nursing trends we expect to happen in 2020, all right? Well, at least start to happen in 2020. You'll, you'll see when we go through some of the, the things that are supposed to happen or we were, uh, trends that are supposed to start this year. And really, um, there were just a few I wanted to touch on when exactly. I said this. Like, this is great. People can review this article. It's actually from um, Carson Newman, which is, excuse me, too much, too much uh, coffee. Oh, it's life. It happens. Hiccups. Yeah. Um, so it's it's from Carson Newman, uh, which is a Christian university. I don't really know anything about this university, but I look through their list and I'm like, this actually, I can verify the credibility of this article just because this is stuff that I've started to see as a yes. trend as well. Um, so there's 25, but we don't need... A whole 25 yeah. would be like a whole separate episode. Exactly, exactly. So uh, th if we were to go down the, the list of 25, and you know me, I, I like to go in on things. But look, listen, listen, the way we're going to go through this is simple. I'm going to put the link in the description box below where you mm -hmm. guys can see the article and you guys can go through it yourself. But I went through it and I, there was a couple of things that I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, yes, I, I'm super excited for this. Oh no, this is not something I think that should happen. And then there was something I was like, fake news, this is never going to happen. Stop lying to me, all right? Stop <laughs> fucking lying to me. So, uh, uh, so I want to know, um, you can tell me a couple of things that you really thought I'm excited for, I don't believe, or uh, like this is the worst thing that could happen. There, to there, are, there are two that I want to speak, and I, they're related. So yes. this is why I want to cover this, because um, it's directly nursing related, and also it's an, a message that I try to preach to my community, and I think this is a great trend. Okay, so the Institute of Medicine back in like, I don't know, 1999 or something like that, when they did their report on safety safety and like patient mortality and like all of that stuff. One of the things they said was they set this benchmark that they wanted to have all nurses have a BSN by 2020 or mm. like something like 70%. I can't remember, but they wanted to have a majority of nurses have a bachelor's degree because studies and trends show that nurses that have more education have better patient outcomes. There's just a different level of critical thinking and all these other extra bits of knowledge that come with time and education. So the first thing I wanted to touch on, number one on this list, is that online education programs are going to increase in popularity. Yes. We're going to see more, and, and I know, I, I mean, I can... I can just, you know, throw a handful of uh, peanuts in a room and hit at least 10 people at work that are doing online education programs. This includes not only like getting master's degrees, DNPs, moving on in their practice, but this also includes nurses that are staying at the bedside and they're doing like certification exams online. Um, they're, they're taking extra extraneous coursework that doesn't have anything to do with a degree. They're just like learning different skills and techniques people. So anyway, um, I think that uh, one of the key recommendations from the Institute of Medicine, according to this article, was that they wanted to have 80% of nurses with a bachelor's degree. But anyway, it's becoming easier and easier to do this. And we used to think of online degrees, like nursing degrees, as like how could you possibly learn that online? Well, maybe for your, like your first licensure, like your nursing program, but if you're earning a master's degree in education, if you're doing, you know, a lot of these programs are making it so you can just find, you can take this online program, find clinical um, hours in your community, which is a whole other issue. But the point is more and more people have access to schools without having to move across the country because by the time you get into grad school, odds are you're like, you know, doing the, the American family exactly. thing. Like you're married, yeah. you have kids, you want to buy a house. You don't want to reroute every two to four years for a new degree at a different school. So I think that it's really great that online education is no longer these like gimmicky fly by night non accredited schools. Like you can get accredited education through online programs and you can do it at your own pace. You can do those 18 month wham, bam, and you're done programs. Wham, bam. <laughs> or you can do what I did where you just like nickel and dime your bachelor's and you know, go through the coursework over time while you're working. Yes. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to highlight. And then the other one is that um, number six on this list, is that higher education degrees will become the norm. Now, some people may see this as like diluting the field and not having enough advanced practice jobs to fill. But the thing is, is that as our, 
it's a whole separate issue. Like we need bedside nurses to remain at the bedside. We constantly need experience at the bedside, even though these people are like moving on to become like nurse practitioners and clinical nurse leaders. But the point is, is that the more education you have, the better, like there's never going to be a situation in nursing where it's like, whoa, whoa I am over educated. Like I know <laughs> too much. Right. Like you're never going to hit that point. So whether it be online CEUs that actually interest you or, you know, doing your doctorate on online while you work at the bedside. Like, um, I just think that it's really great that nurses have more and more and more and more opportunities to mm. do these things at their pace, at the level of education they want to achieve. And then, you know, I don't think there's any shame Granted, if you have a master's degree and you have the loans to pay off, you want to have a job that pays you more. But also, like, I know lots of nurses that have advanced degrees and they love the bedside. Yes. And their practice is so much better because they are so educated and they have so much understanding of advanced concepts. And, um, you know, those are the nurses on the unit that you go to with the question that nobody else can answer. And they're right. like, well, actually. So I think that that those are the things I wanted to highlight in this. And there's a lot of other really of great, course. there was nothing on this list that I was like, Psh, no. Um, Wait, but so, like so, bilingual nurses are become, gonna become a, a more important aspect of nursing. Nurses getting education on different languages, American Sign Language. Uh, it goes on and on. I just think education is is easier than ever, and I hope that uh, nurses seek out this information if they feel like they're ready to like level up their their practice. Yeah, no, and so like, look, uh, um, Adrienne and I just we didn't like talk about this. I mean, we we talked about what stories we were going to cover, but we didn't say which ones we chose. Um, and it's really funny, but uh, because number six uh, out of the twenty five um, is also on my list of things mm -hmm. that I am. I don't want to say excited for, but things that I am definitely seeing, it's literally, I'd say every other nurse, every third nurse I talk to is like, yeah, I'm going to go back to get my NP. I'm going to go back to be a CRNA. I'm going to go get my advanced practicing in nursing. Like, literally the vast yes. majority of nurses are doing more education and it does tie into the other one you said about yeah it's easier now it's 2020 you can get accredited programs degrees schooling and you don't have to leave your living room. You could do it mm -hmm. at your house while you work as a full-time. The way you and I are talking Fantastic. right now. I actually learned how to use this conference software through my online nursing program. Exactly. So, I, I think it's wonderful. Um, the other two that I am, um, uh, am, am, I would say, uh, the other one that I'm excited for, and one of them that I really like, so I, I know you said you don't believe that any of these are fake news, but there's one of them I think. Okay, what's <laughs> The one I think is fake news because I haven't seen even like a dent in it. I know it's 2020 and I know I think I know which one is getting better, say. but telehealth and chatbot services are making it easier for patients to access care. Maybe because I've only worked in the big city. Maybe mm -hmm. because I worked in Portland, Maine. I've worked in uh, uh, what's it called uh, in Connecticut in a big city in Connecticut. And I've worked in Boston that, I don't see this as a thing. Maybe it's in rural country, like Midwestern, yes. whatever, uh, yes. America, but I have not seen a single telehealth. I've not seen a single chatbot. I've never so seen remember, any of it. Any telehealth, of it. telehealth can take on multiple forms. Even wearing a Holter monitor to monitor your heart rhythms for a period while you're out doing your normal life, that itself is telehealth. My, um, my patients that are on BiPAP, like there are outpatient clinics in my area that they have the BiPAP machine automatically transmit data to your medical record. Mm. So telehealth is not just like sitting down at a laptop to like have a doctor's appointment. But I do think that here in Iowa, because we have so many patients that become, uh, that come to us from long distances, rural areas, like we have even people coming from like Illinois and Missouri, because we're like down in the South, Southeast corner of the state. So we're kind of like near a couple other, you know, Illinois and Missouri, like I said. Yes. So we do see people people that can't necessarily come back. You know, there are people that are doing peritoneal dialysis at home because coming in mm -hmm. for hemodialysis is just too much. So we do have those kind of like telehealth instances and I'm not well versed on it because I don't work in it. 
I would love to talk to a telehealth nurse. Put in the call, oh. put in the call out right now. Um, right. So I do think that it it still is in a, a major period of growth, and we're not seeing it yet. But you know, as um, even if we look at community nurses being able to use technology to chart when they're out in the field. Like, so it takes on lots of different ways. Definitely. Would I like to see more like traditional, what we think of a telehealth where a doctor sits down and sees a certain number of patients a day? Um, I do think that is happening. Probably not to the extent that you see it in major cities because, you know, Everyone's you, close by. You, can, you can hit a golf ball with the next hospital, you know, to the next right? hospital. No, but like, so that's the thing. And the reason I brought that as one that I think is going to take much longer than starting or mm-hmm. seeing a trend in yeah. 2020 is because I feel like five years ago it was like we still had major, major hospitals still using paper charting. Fuck out of here with this telehealth. Yeah. I don't believe telehealth is going to be a real thing until it's a real thing. And I think it should mm-hmm. be a real thing, but I feel like it's, it's happening, you it. know, and I, you know, I also think the thing that piggybacks off of that that's on this list is that um, we have retail health clinics and yeah. we have all these, at least in my area, I mean, we've got a spattering of clinics that are like your quick care clinics where you don't need to clog up the emergency department. You can go to this quick care clinic. It's tiny. It's in the strip mall. You can go in there, see an actual nurse practitioner and you're out the door and you're not, you know, you're not utilizing emergency services. Is that the same thing as like urgent health or express So we actually, my healthcare system has, um, which it's small, but growing, but my healthcare system has urgent care clinics, which are like not quite emergency, but it should probably be handled quickly. And then we have the quick care clinics. It's like, oh, I think I have strep. I just need a strep test. So we have different levels of care. Mm. And I think that's becoming more and more popular because there are so many Americans that don't have access to a primary care physician for whatever reason. Um, And so being able to go in and see somebody for 50 bucks, get a strep test, get a script for antibiotics if that's appropriate, and then go on about your day instead of sitting in the ED and not being seen for five hours because you're the least important critical case there. You know what I mean? Like Exactly. But also, you know, you can go into um, like CVS or you can like go into Walgreens. You can have a consultation with a pharmacist and this takes the place of like, you know, here in town, Mercy Hospital has Mercy on call, which literally you can just like call up, talk to a nurse and be like, is this worth coming in for or do I just have a virus and I need to let it, that's a great service. And granted, there's a huge liability because these nurses can't assess and diagnose over the phone, but they can say, stay home, do this, go see a doctor in a day or two or get thine ass to the emergency department now. Um, So there are all different ways this kind of telehealth and, um, alternative health clinics are kind of working their way into the mainstream so Um, it's happening it'll happen i I think it is i think it is i just i just i have a hard time believing it's gonna happen as soon as this year but to wrap this up one of my favorite things on the list absolute favorite thing and i know i'm biased because it speaks to me specifically but number 10 on the 25 list is more nurses uh more um more male nurses i'm sorry is it 25 is it 10 yeah it's 20 it's number 10 Oh, no, Uh, no, 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 no. Male nurses. Anyway, there's, I'll find it. Keep talking. The proportion of 11, excuse me. The proportion of male nurses will rise. (laughs) Oh, Adrienne, listen, listen to me. I love you, ladies. I think the nurse's station is fun. I could talk about The Bachelor. Like, I, I, I know everything that happened in The Bachelor that I haven't seen a single episode, and I love it. But God damn it. Just a little bit more testosterone, a little more brotherly. I can't say I'm not happy about this. This makes me so, so happy. Listen, listen. This is good news. Every time I see a group of nursing students come in and I see that one male nurse or that one male nursing student, I give him a high five. I give him a hug. I say, welcome to the team guy. I'm Mm -hmm. proud to have you. Um, It's a good thing. It's a really, really good thing. And listen, I know that we've had in the past couple of years, the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement. And I think it's been really good that we've like had that conversation, but we've also been saying this toxic masculinity, it's okay to feel the fields. It's okay to want to take care of people. It's okay for men Mm -hmm. to want to do these things and just be human beings. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's great. And I love to hear more male nurses are coming my way. 
I'm really privileged to work in a hospital that has a lot of male nurses mm. and they do, they bring a different strength. It's it, you, you want your patient. I truly believe that to get good health care, we want to be cared for by people that have things in common with us. Yes. And especially for older male patients, you know, some older male patients feel more comfortable talking about certain things with male providers. And nurses are badass. Nurses, we think of like nurses, we think of, you know, there's the stereotypical male nurses like homosexual or like anti-masculine or like there's all these bullshit very flamboyant just yeah. just yeah. stupid but the thing is is that nursing is a badass industry mm -hmm. and you have to be strong you have to be smart you have to also have that compassionate those soft skills but honestly like i see a lot of and maybe this is maybe this is a stereotype within the stereotype but the male nurses that i come across they work all over the hospital but the highest concentration in my hospital of male nurses are in the emergency department and the critical care areas. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that like you can get your adrenaline pumping in the mm -hmm. ICU. It is physical, <laughs> it is emotionally and mentally challenging. And I think that the men that come into nursing are especially strong because they're like setting aside all of those bullshit stereotypes and they're like, I can save your fucking life one-handed. Like right. don't even, it, it's 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 badass it and is. so don't, don't I, gas me up i'm already excited don't gas me <laughs> up girl you know about that life All right, yeah me, so me. i i love my male nurses i try not to abuse them for being like bigger and stronger like hey can you help me boost the 600 pound patient no i don't need more help i got him <laughs> no i don't i don't i don't pull that shit but um yeah love love the men in nursing Listen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Adrienne. Thank you so much <laughs> for doing you. this with me. But before we go, listen, every week we do this. We do the end of news report. Um, uh, and, and I like to do the end of news report is because we talk about stories. We talk about things that are happening right now in nursing. You know, we do the information ses sessions, but I like to break it down and just have a conversation with my co-host, talk to y'all when I'm doing the solo dolo Um so this is just a time where we can just talk as human beings. We're not reading from a report, an article, no statistics. We're just talking as human beings, as nurses. Um, and there's a couple of things I wanted to just ask you about. Because, okay. look, so there's two things. Number one, we're going to talk, it's going to be a little serious. We're going to talk about the primaries. We're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about why you feel it is necessary or not necessary to share that kind of stuff. I'd like mm -hmm. to see your perspective on that. And then we're going to lighten it up. And, and we're talking about, um, we're recording this the day after Valentine's Day. You love birds out there. Um, and we're going to talk about what you did for Valentine's Day, how you feel about Valentine's Day, and um, my Valentine's Day as well. Um, so jumping in with the first and the news report story topic. Adrienne, you, so you said, and, and, and it's a, such a good thing that you said this while we were recording, because now we could just follow up on it. Mm -hmm. You said that you don't want to put a lot of your politics out there because you don't want to, um, I don't want to say, uh, you, you don't want patients to see your public image, public profile, public whatever, and feel some type of way when they see you walk into the room, which I actually mm -hmm. never thought about it like that, but it is super important. Like, I, you'd never want a, a patient to feel that type of way, especially when you walk into the room, mm -hmm. but at the same time, what do you consider? What do you consider politics? Do you consider politics like I have a strong feeling that everyone should get vaccinated? I think that's huge in politics. Mm -hmm. I think healthcare is a right and not a privilege. That is a huge politics. I, like, do you think that is something you can talk about versus I support Bernie Elizabeth Warren? Like, where do you draw, so draw the line is... and how do you decide? This is a this is a, again a huge gray area, and I'll I'll illustrate kind of how I feel with a an experience that I had at work not very long ago. So I'm in Southeast Iowa. Iowa City is generally pretty liberal and socially uh, progressive, but um, it's a very white state. It's a very elderly state as a whole, and there are a lot of folks here that are very conservative. And without going too greatly into detail, I am uber liberal to the point of being quite radical. And I even believe that some of our most left candidates aren't 
exactly as left as I would stand to tolerate. Um, I also am one of those people that believes that we have enough resources on this planet to make sure that nobody is dying in the street outside of your fucking million dollar condo. Right. Um, so I have very strong beliefs about that, but I'm not one of those people that's like, um, eager to talk about. So anyway, I, I have a lot of patients that are very conservative. Fox News is blaring on the TV in their rooms all the time. I try not to engage in conversation, but I had a patient not long ago who I've taken care of before. He's a very kind person. Um, I've never had any complaints. He's a pleasure, pleasure to take care of, and he is extremely conservative. And I know this about him. And the day that after the Iowa caucuses, which I did caucus, um, which that that's a whole other topic because that was quite the shit show. I think caucusing yeah, yeah, yeah. can work on a small yeah. scale. Yeah, yeah, but when you that got, up, guy. <laughs> damn, I found a seat and I didn't get out of that seat for like three and a half hours. It was Jesus. chaotic. It was like people in a sardine can. No wonder the process was so fucked over. Yeah. It just wasn't. It's like, you know, putting 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. Um, <laughs> about it. <Yo>. Anyway. <laughs> that nursing life. <laughs> anyway, he was like, so did you caucus last night? Oh, shit. And he, I've never talked to him before. And for a brief second, I was like, what do you mean? I don't know. Here's your heparin. <laughs> um, but I, I took a deep breath and I said, yes, yes, I did. And he said, oh, my friend's so-and-so whatever my kids and like all my people are are like they're caucus for warren or they caucus for bernie or whatever and i was like oh okay so maybe this isn't going to be like this like put your dukes up let's what? fight it out mm -hmm. um it was a very civil conversation it was a very superficial we didn't talk very much i didn't go into super great depth but um it was one of those circumstances where i was like whoo that could have been a really tense situation. And I have to be in there. I have to assess you. I have to, you know, and some people are not so nice about conversing with people that are different or believe differently. But that's just, that was a rare circumstance where I was like, oh, that, that worked out okay. Like, he knows I'm, I'm going to take good care of him. He thanks me for my care. Like, he knows that I'm on time with meds. He trusts me and I haven't tarnished that relationship. But... I don't trust that that's going to be the experience I have with everything. Oh, no. So I try to keep it to a, like, if people say like, Oh, that blah, 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 fill in the most offensive thing I've ever heard here. What do you think? And I'll just be like, Oh, you know, I don't know. That's, that's a tough question. Here's your Tylenol. Do you want a right. heat pack? And yes. then I, I divert. Um, so I, but, but it's touchy. It's touchy. So for me. look, and I love that. And I think, um, so I, if, if you guys just see what I put out there, like my content when I put out there, you would think that I would never stop talking politics. But <laughs> I, I swear to God, like even like, not even just when I'm in patients' room and patients have like Fox News or whatever on or, or MSNBC. I don't, I don't, I don't, like it just, it never phases me. It never comes mm -hmm. up and I never talk about it. Not mm -hmm. only do I not do that, but I also never talk politics, like politics, politics at the nurse's station. Like when it comes to work, Same. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I'm like blank slate. Like I'll just take it in. I'll, I'll say like really like superficial level things when it comes mm -hmm. to like things that I feel, but I go get a coffee. I'm exactly. like, I'm, just I'm piecing things, out of this conversation. Let things be. Um, but I, I want to push you on this, Adrienne, just a little bit more. How, like, are you not comfortable sharing how you feel politically on nursing uncensored are you not comfortable sharing it on your instagram on your on snapchat or on, on social media is that way like or do you think it's my personal life i'm not working i don't have my nursing scrubs on i can say and do as both I it's kind of it's kind of situational for me because um i'm very opinionated mm -hmm. i ve have very here's the thing. And if I don't have a strong opinion, I'll just say like, I just don't know enough about this. Um, which is sometimes why I like to steer clear of talking about primaries, current events and things like that, because sometimes I have to take media breaks. Like I deal with such heavy shit at work all the time that sometimes when I come home and I have like one day off between shifts, I don't want to look at the news. Right. I don't want to look at the news in between shifts. It's just going to aggravate me. It's just going to make me feel terrible about things. So sometimes there's like a week goes by and I haven't looked at the news. That comes from a place of privilege. I am in a place where I recognize that like not everybody gets the uh the the joy of 
setting those scandals and that shit aside. So I recognize that that's something that I'm lucky to do. And I try to work as an advocate for people that don't have that. However, um, I just don't see, I read, let me summarize as this. I read something the other day that hit home for me and is how I feel. It said, when I argue, or I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. When I talk about politics, when I argue my side, I'm not doing it to convince the person that disagrees with me. I'm doing it so that the person that I'm standing up for hears that someone is standing up for them. That someone with a piece of, I don't think what I have is power with the podcast, but people listen to me. I do get to put a message out on a grand scale more than most people. And so I take that very seriously, but I do it more so like, I know I'm not going to convince the most diehard Donald Trump fan that he is an atrocity of American politics, even though that's how I feel. Um, but more so I'm speaking out because I want the most disenfranchised people to know that someone who is not heavily disenfranchised is paying attention to them and is fighting for them and is voting with them in their mind. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? I love, I love that. Look, listen, listen, listen. (laughs) And I respect (laughs) it. I said something good. (laughs) (laughs) And I respect it so much just because I don't feel that way. And you're a better person for feeling that way because I do believe I got that, like that silver top. I feel like I could convince the world. (laughs) Like, I feel like I got that kind of But people like me need people like you. Because I can't do that. I need you out there doing the front line uh, you're fighting. A good, you're a good lady. You're a good lady. <laughs> All right, listen. Before we wrap this up, this conversation up, I do want to ask, and I don't know if you've put it out there before, but you just said you caucus. This is the nursing mm-hmm. news. We are talking politics. I got to ask. I have to. Obviously, you don't have to answer, but I have to ask. Who's your caucus sure. for? Who's your guy? Who's I, ca- your guy? I caucus for Bernie Sanders. Ooh. I also caucused for Bernie Sanders in 2016. And I did so with a raging upper respiratory infection. And I wore a fucking mask the whole time. Um, but, but also, I will support whomever the Democratic nominee is. I would love to see a world where third party candidates have a viable chance, Mm -hmm. but seeing as I would, you know, I'm kind of in the anybody but Trump category. Not really. I want to see a liberal in the White House. I want to see a democratic uh, socialist government uh, there, that's my there, there's that's my summary. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, spilling the tea, yo, you guys. Spilling I got the tea, it. you I heard got, it here first, <laughs> exclusive. That's it. I got. I, I haven't I, even I, said that on my own show. Yo, that's what happens when you come on the nurse and news with Q's nurse. I pull out the goodness. All right, you do. Look, listen, we talked all the heavy stuff. All right, it's the day after Valentine's Day. I know you were in a, a relationship, marriage. I forget. I'm sorry if I did, but I, I am in a long term relationship, not married. Not but, married. Um, but yes, no. that's what I thought. So. Mm-hmm. Valentine's Day. Do you believe it? Do you celebrate it? What'd you guys do? What happened? I mean, we're both, he and I are, I know this sounds cheesy and super cliche, I love but cheese. we truly, we truly are the people that um, believe that I don't need a commercially designated holiday to show how I feel. Hey, and, and, yeah, and the other thing is girl. I'm one of those women. Here's the thing. I don't want a bouquet of flowers. If you want to buy me a plant that I can keep alive for 20 <laughs> years. Cool. I don't want chocolate. I'm not a sweet town. Buy me a bag of beef jerky. Uh, you know, get, I saw something that was like, get her a, pickle bouquet and i posted that on my facebook and i said hey doug if we can do a pickle bouquet then maybe i'll celebrate what's a Valentine's pickle bouquet Day. what's a pickle bouquet? you know like those edible arrangements where you can get like it's like it looks like flowers but it's like skewers with like pineapple and strawberries oh, yes, and shit yes, on yes, it yes, yes. yeah pickles man You're i love insane. pickles i'm a i'm a halo You're file insane. i need salty not sweet so anyway the, what I'm getting to is we don't officially celebrate Valentine's Day. However, his birthday is on the 17th. And so this weekend is birthday celebration. Weekend. So even though there is not exclusive Valentine's Day celebration, we are doing, we're making dinners together. He loves playing backgammon. I don't love it so much, but like we're, we're, you know, we're like approaching our forties. We like being at home and drinking good booze and like, I'm going to be making some Kentucky mules tonight for myself, oh, shit. Um, you know, just like chilling simple because things. it is, that's exactly what it is. And we, the crowning and we're food nerds. So mm. the crowning glory of this weekend is we are making a dish called Bosam 
and it is a Korean pork roast okay. that is, imagine the most delicious thing you've ever eaten. Okay, stop. And then stomp <laughs> on it because it's not as good as balsam. <laughs> it's basically like sugar and salt brined pork. You get a nice crispy edge to it. And then you eat it like a taco. You get a little lettuce, you get a bib lettuce leaf, you put some rice, you put some meat, and then you put these sauces that are like ginger, scallions, jalapenos, mm -hmm. rice vinegar, oil. Like it's... Mm, I'm like salivating just thinking about it. So that's how we celebrate. Good for you. Look, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> With Korean I don't care, pork roast. <laughs> I, I don't care how bad or un um, pictureable that it comes out. You better post it on your Insta story or something. I want to see what it looks like. All right. Okay. Because I don't believe it tastes. It's as I've done best it before. I'll find. I'll find it here. The, okay. So we've we've. It's a special occasion meal because it takes a couple days to brine. Oh Jesus um, Lord. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's all worth it. But we've had couples over before, and we warn them, like, unbutton your pants now, because it's coming. <laughs> this is the kind of meal that you eat it, and then as you're sitting at the table, belly out, about to throw up because you're so full, and yet you're still picking at the dish on the stove, pulling oh, out God. the little crunchy pieces of meat, and you're like, why am I still eating? This is so good. Oh, it hurts so bad, but it's so good. That's that's what it is for us. And it's happened to other people that have never had it before, so I know it's true. And last question before we, we say our goodbyes. <laughs> does he does he does he feel the same way about yeah. Valentine's Day and commercial yeah. Is yeah. You, and I'm or is this something you decided for the team? No, no, this, we feel the same way. And um, it, as cheesy as it sounds, we do do nice things for each other throughout the course of that. the weeks and months. And so honestly, it's like, you know, in Iowa right now, we had a, a day the other day that was like negative six was like the Jesus high. Christ. And those are the days when like, Jeez. I'm tired. I want to lay on my ass on the couch, but I drive that man to and from work. He works downtown. Parking downtown is expensive. So yeah. me acting as his, his Lyft driver mm. actually is a great act of love. Love. And so we just, that's the important shit. That's a us. huge act of love. I would have been like, mm -hmm. up, homie. Be like, <laughs> I got my slippers on. See you later. No, I mean, these are the things that are important is making sure that, you know, your every day is, uh, shows that person. It sounds like you found a good one. Well, good for you, Adrian. He's oh. incomparable. He's, I could, go. I could go on and on. That's it. That's it. Love's in the end. Look, listen, let me, let me cut, let me tell you guys what I did for my Valentine's Day because it's yeah, short and it. it's sweet and it's simple. This Negro is, is single. So don't worry about what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you and all the rest of you guys that have a, a significant others because I'm single and it hurts. I actually, I want to share this as the final thought to play off of that. I just posted something to Instagram like right before we logged on to this. Yes. And it, it is a meme and it says other kinds of love. Mm. There's BFF love, hobby love, nature love, team love, family love, online friend love. Love ya. Uh, fan love, fuzzy love, gone but not forgotten love, book love, and self love. So. Listen, listen, listen. I know I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm going to say this. The one thing single people don't like, if you were single, Adrienne, I would love to hear that message, but you're in a relationship. I don't want to hear about fuzzy love. I want real love, Adrienne. I get it. But you know what? I wasn't, we weren't always together. I didn't meet him until I was almost 30. So. Mm. Um, so you got to yeah, find him. If you're not if you're not a radical, awesome, self-loving person, what could you possibly give to somebody else? So find oh that self-love and then you can love someone else so much more fully because you don't you don't need them, but you want them. Yes. That's different. Shit, talk about advice. How can I, that's we gotta end it there? That was beautiful, Adrian. That was beautiful. All right, listen, before we go, Adrian, please let the people know where they can find you. I know it was a long time. I had you on here for an hour and a half, maybe two. We've been on for a little bit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, let the people know, be where can they find you? Uh, you can find the Nursing Uncensored universe at nursinguncensored.com. There's podcast episodes, blog, vlog, merch. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Insta. It's all nursing uncensored. Go, fi go find me. All nursing uncensored. Everywhere you look. All simple. All great things. Listen, um, per usual, all the links to her Insta, YouTube, um, definitely the podcast and definitely the website are going to be in the description down below. So click, click, click. Go find it. Listen, I'm telling you guys, when Adrienne brings the best side of me. That's why we were on here for years talking about four full goddamn stories. Listen, I love it. Love it. I love it. Adrienne, thank you so much. Thank Have you for one. being a wonderful host. I always enjoy talking with you. 
Of course. I'll catch you on the flip, Adrian. Thank you so much. Happy nursing. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate this. If you guys were informed or educated in any way, shape, or form by these stories, um, please hit that like button. If you liked my presentation of the news, I really suggest you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know every time Q the Nurse drops some hot, fresh press news. Thank you. Catch you next week. Deuces.